gonna we're gonna make this intro really super short because I think you've got an opportunity to make this really nice and uh, intimate. Uh, this is Gary. Gary likes looking at big issues in the world. Uh, I was scanning through his uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and all that sort of good stuff later, and that usually makes people nervous because they're like, "Oh my God, what's he gonna say?" Uh, I picked out two things. He works with a lot of Fortune 100 companies, so that's literally the hundred biggest companies in the world. That's pretty awesome, right? But that's not big enough. Uh, you're on the board of a group of people who are looking at empowering or how to empower one billion milliard for the Dutch people in the room, women by 2020. That's pretty fucking big. Huge. Look, are you going to talk a bit about that today, or is this in a different direction? Uh, it's in a different direction, but it's related. Uh, all right. Then I'm, I'm going to want to catch up with you later or afterwards or offline or online sometime about how you're going to solve that challenge particularly. Ladies and gentlemen, make him feel at home. Make him feel... Like a, oh, he's also a campus party veteran, six times. That's pretty damn cool. Make him feel welcome here at the first campus party here in the Netherlands. Hey. Good evening, everybody. So, our world. What's interesting about our world is that we're about 7.4 billion human beings, but we're all just one kind of a, kind of a big ocean. And the interesting thing about that ocean, for the most part, is that just like waves that are a little bit mundane and irrelevant, for the most of the time over the past couple hundred years, that w that's what we've spent our time doing. The opportunity we have is that over the course of these first few decades of this new century, the thing is, what a lot of folks are telling you in the media these days, in the conventional wisdom, is that we just need a little bit of infrastructure technology and humans and that they're, they're just going to perfectly blur together. Well, in reality, that's not how the world really works. And the, the blurring of those lines is what we're going to talk about here today, because 21st century leadership is much more in depth than just infrastructure, technology, and humans. Because when you seek the obvious, that makes you truly oblivious. What everybody's trying to sell you is that you're going to be a smart person with a smartphone in a smart city living a smart life. But there are very critical steps that are going to make the difference between whether you have that life or some other type of life over the course of the next few decades. And the reason why is because the world right now is being swallowed up. It's being swallowed up by human oceans in unpredictable ways in places like Dhaka, Bangladesh. It's also being swallowed up in somewhat more predictable ways in human grids, in principled ways of New York City. The problem is that these concrete jungles and these urban sprawls aren't actually who we truly are and who we want to be. And the evidence is actually kind of clear. We have environment that's devolving into exploitation. We have government that's starting to devolve into dictatorship. We have health care that's devolving into sick care, and we have business that more and more is devolving into monopoly. And that's why Chuck's statement is so important today. When did our future actually become a threat to our own survival? Right? And what does that mean for us as leaders in the 21st century? Well, the truth is, your reality actually lies outside of your comfort zone. Right? And that's what we're going to talk about here today and what those principles actually are and why they matter. So here's a little bit about me. I've been to more, th I've been to more than 60 countries. And what I do is help project the future. I'm a futurist. And so I'm grounded in the reality of now. I spend, more t I spend time in more than 40 countries a year. And my background is having spent time in places like Brazil, to Mexico, from Rwanda to South Africa, from Afghanistan to places like Bangladesh. Talking with folks about the intersection of four different pillars which we're going to talk about here today. But before we get there, one of the most critical things that we have to understand as we move forward as leaders in the 21st century is that life is actually reflecting more of those who are being left behind than those who actually have opportunity. We will not see smart cities, we will not see smart companies, we will not see smart communities until we have very principled, directive, and inclusive solutions for most of the human challenges that we face today. So I'm here today to talk to you about the upcoming tsunami. 
The bad news is that on one hand, it's going to disrupt your communities, your companies, your families, and in particular, those little puzzle pieces of how you think your life is perfectly going to work out. The good news is we're going to talk about ways and strategies in which you can buttress what's coming. But the first step is understanding what we've forgotten. As we supposedly get smarter and smarter and faster and faster, what happens is our minds actually become narrower and narrower. Right? We want everything in 100, 140 characters. We want everything a page to load in less than one hundred thousandth of a second. And if we don't get that, our brain freaks out. But what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is we forget the number one point of all of this. It's connectivity. It's humanity. It's community. Because at the root of any living system is human beings. Us as humans. Whether it's a company, whether it's a community, whether it's a family, whether it's a city, a state, or a nation. Those are all abstract concepts if we don't have us. Right? So it matters if we put ourselves first or not. So let's talk about what that actually means. Right? How do we put ourselves first? Well, there's one resource that is the most abundant thing we have to leverage, and that's our ingenuity. Right? Human ingenuity is the most abundant resource we have, yet we're not leveraging it to its full capacity, and we're not implementing it in a way that's actually strategic. And the reason why is because conventional wisdom just talks a little bit about technology and a little bit about infrastructure, and then you just dump in humans and spr sprinkle some pixie dust, and it's magically all just going to work. But in reality, there's four particular pillars that ensure stability for you, for your family, for your community, your cities, your companies, and your nations. The first pillar is called innovation. Innovation is defined as the forward motion of creation. The second pillar is technology. Technology is what accelerates intent. It's neither good nor bad. But what we have to understand about technology is it accelerates intent. The third pillar is culture. Culture is defined as the shared themes, memes, characteristics, and myths of a particular community. And last but not least is justice. Right? So this is everything from counterviolent extremism to youth engagement, to other things that tie in all the other three pillars. The reason why these four pillars matter is because innovation and technology are what create or reinforce a culture. And those three pillars together are what create the emergent opportunity for justice to actually be something that can happen for you, for your family, for your city, for your community, or your country. You can't have one without the other. If it's one thing I've learned in globetrotting to more than 60 countries is that there's a definitive point that we all have. On one side, you can decide to be an isolated island. Right? That's one way in which humans are deciding to go. And countries, and communities, and families. The other opportunity is to be much more like an ocean. United, in a community, and connected. The opportunity is really to embrace a new creative energy, to be an ocean. It's not to be an isolated island. Things that are isolated die. Things that seek equilibrium die. Right? Nature is a network. Nature always seeks friction. Nature always seeks other inputs to be able to thrive. And the reason that matters is because these are the types of environments that are actually going to win in the 21st century. Right? In particular, companies, communities, and cities. So what we're going to do is talk about what are the shared values that matter for each of us going forward. And they're actually really simple. They're actually really, truly simple. We just don't spend a lot of time being principled around thinking about them and putting them into strategies and in towards our visions for ourselves and our communities. All right, so the first, be respectful of others. Kind of common sense, right? But I'll tell you what, the second one, seeing any beyond yourself, is not something we spend a lot of time thinking about. We think about ourselves, we think about our families, but we never think about unifying with a broader community most of the time. I will tell you, when the tsunami comes, there's strength in unity. None of us, none of us are strong enough to be isolated. That's what we think, that we are all self-sufficient, but that's just an illusion. Fourth, 
believe in better real world solutions. I think all of us can agree that most of us want a better life and that we all believe in one true outcome that humans deserve better. And if that's true, then all of us deserve to be accountable for our results too. Is it because it's not just about you and it's not just about me. It's about all of us standing up and coming together and making a difference in this world. The opportunity lies outside of the middle. The leaders of the 21st century and the examples that we're going to go through are folks who don't stay in the middle. Middle's the safest place to be, but in reality at the edge is where chaos and resiliency are born. On the edge is where opportunity and unity is built. That's why 21st century leaders ride the wave. They understand the power of an emergent energy. They understand the power of unity, collaboration, and taking all four of those pillars, innovation, technology, culture, and justice, and using them to their advantage in the way that they see a better world. Because at the end of the day, I think all of us would agree that we all do deserve better. Right? whether it's in our communities, our families, or our companies. What I pride myself on is this. Right? How many of you have gone through the education system? Raise your hand. All of us, right? All of us have had to sit in these chairs. But the connectors, the rule breakers, the game changers, sitting in chairs is not what we do. Right? Sitting in chairs is what we string up and push away. Because the opportunity in the 21st century for leadership is not thinking with inside the box. What you're trying to do is think outside the box, or more importantly, actually make the box irrelevant. That's why in the 21st century, for folks who do think about the obvious, I call them serial. Because people who think about the obvious are going to get eaten. The opportunity is not in the box. It's in making the box irrelevant. And why? Because we're trying to uproot, eradicate, and transform people, communities, companies, and families into a new emergent phenomenon of opportunity. That's something that takes momentum. And the best way to, get go to make that happen is to get moving. The best opportunity is the first step. Right? It's easy to make an excuse not to move. It's easy to, not think, it's easy to think about an oncoming tsunami and not want to move. But at the end of the day, if you don't move now, you're never going to start moving. So how do we do that? Well, leaders in the 21st century, they have a saying, and it's called, I do nothing alone. Let me say that again. Leaders in the 21st century have a saying, and it's called, I do nothing alone. Because once again, if you're worried only about yourself, right, it's never about you. It's about everybody else but you. The journey as a creator, the journey as an entrepreneur is a journey of service and helping build better families, better communities, better cities and states more stability for all of us. We must and we will win together because unity is that opportunity. Right? The challenge we have is that we don't talk a lot about how to actually make stability happen. Outside of innovation, technology, culture, and justice, there's a three-part formula of how you build a sustainable community, company, city, state, or a nation. We spend a lot of time talking first about processes, but processes aren't what makes stability. Culture is the underlying root of stability in the 21st century. Why? Because all of us are human beings. In a stable family, community, company, city or state or a nation is underlined by us. Those abstract concepts are dictated by the cultures, the shared means, themes and characteristics that we come from. Therefore, the processes that we look to put in place, technology or infrastructure, is actually informed first and foremost by culture. You start with culture, which then shows processes when, where, why, and how to be implemented. And then ultimately, those processes are supplemented by knowledge. And that, in the middle, my friends, is where the entrepreneur lives, at the intersection of CPK, culture, process, knowledge. I do another talk called Secrets of the World's Su Most Successful Companies. For over a decade, I studied the Fortune 5,000 most fastest growing companies. This is how the most successful companies literally are built, scaled, and sold. It's the same formula for families. It's the same formula for cities. It's the same formula for nations as well. 
Now, what we have to also understand outside of that is how the individual reflects the collective. As I said before, you are part of your community. You are part of your city. You are part of your nation. What we don't think about most of the time is how the individual reflects the collective and the collective reflects the individual. And the reason that matters is because they're both self-reinforcing. The question we have is, how do you actually make that alignment happen? Right? Two use cases very quickly. Right? One in Triboli, Slovenia, a place called Catapult. It's a 24-7 work-live play center by the founders of a company called Devisoft. That center allows innovators and entrepreneurs to live, work, and play every single day, every single second. Right? They can live, work, and play. In St. Louis, I'm one of the co-founders of the largest live, work, play center in the world. It's called the Art of Living Building. We have uh, 50,000 square feet, 300 entrepreneurs who live, work, and play in that facility. And next door, we have one of the top 100 concert venues in the country that we also co-own as well. It seems a little bit abstract when, when you look at this next slide about how you democratize abundance. But at the end of the day, at the root of democratizing abundance is giving folks opportunity. At the root, we are all creators. And what we seek is an opportunity for economic inclusion and participation. The best way to do that is to bring folks together in small, nimble collectives in an environment that is amorphous and can move in and out simultaneously. That's all a Live Work Play Center is. You can step in, you can step out. You want to work there, you want to dance there, you want to sleep there, you want to do nothing there. It's up to you. Right? How many of you have ever heard of kibbutzes before in Israel? Right? Same type of concept. It's not a new concept, and it's an, but it's a concept that is now emerging and coming to the forefront. And it's coming to the forefront because culture in the 21st century, as things speed up faster and faster, and things become less and less smooth for us, more and more things will be dictated by culture and that collective unity in small spaces. And that's why Live Work Play Centers are one of the underlying futures for our nation, for our cities and nations around the world. But why does that matter? It matters because life is not about what we are given, it's about what we create. So let's talk about a couple case studies that take the future into account. The first, the government of Singapore. The government of Singapore has more than a thousand online services that you can access at any time. They also have more than 300 services that you can access by your mobile phone at any time as well. Right? That is a connected government that wants to engage with you on an open platform. A second example would be Estonia. What Estonia has done is basically rip apart their entire architecture and put data and your privacy, your security, and transparency at the core of how they operate. Right? They've also made sure to future-proof their government infrastructure by putting data at the middle. Because data is one of those things that will increasingly be more and more either stolen or exploited. And what this government is trying to do is make sure that you control it, that you decide instead of someone else deciding for you. Next, let's talk about cities. Right? This is Richmond, Virginia. In Richmond, Virginia, they took a, a small house concept, small city house concept, from Oregon and Washington State, and they brought it to Richmond, Virginia. So this is a 60 to 80 square foot house that only costs $30 a month. And for those $30 a month, all you have to do is community work shifts, right? And if you think about that, think about the power of just having a house. If you don't have a house, how are you supposed to have a relationship? How are you supposed to get a job if you don't have a postal address, right? It's the simple things that we take for granted that make the exponential difference over the long term. Another example, is what Michael Bloomberg is doing with the Global Governors Challenge. He gives away four, top, four prizes up to a million dollars and then one top prize of five million dollars every year. More than 500 cities across five continents currently take place in this challenge. And as each challenge happens and as those folks get awarded, these cities, once again, take those solutions and use them. They leverage, they collaborate, they unify. Let's talk about smart companies, right? Nature has been using networks for eons. That is how nature survives, right? Everything we're talking about is about networks. And at the root of networks is collective intelligence. Collective intelligence is how dolphin pods work, how beehives work, and how ant colonies work. 
Steve and Heidi Messer created a company called Collective Eye. And what they do is take data intelligence to a new level, a data science and collaborative platform that makes SaaS and disparate SaaS solutions irrelevant. What they've created is a hive mind concept, which is a bold solution considering that so many companies right now use SaaS for this and SaaS for that and SaaS for that. Most companies have hundreds of little SaaS platforms that they use right now. What Steve and Heidi are doing is trying to make that irrelevant. The second company we're going to talk about is by a 20-year-old entrepreneur. What he created is the first 3D prosthetic lab in Argentina. His name is Gino Taburo. And not only is he creating 3D prosthetics for humans, he's also creating them for animals as well. And he's crowdsourcing those solutions, which is pretty interesting. Another example would be Alum Health. Alum Health is a low power, low bandwidth, and miniaturized telemedicine network based out of Dubai. The founder is actually Kurdish and he grew up in Iran. And Alum Health is now one of the leaders in telemedicine, particularly in the radiology sector. The reason I tell you all of these unique examples of folks living outside of the middle and outside of the bell curve is not because I, I'm bringing a call for extremism. Right? This isn't about extremism because you don't get justice through anarchy. You get justice through shared mission, vision, and values. And that's what these leaders who created these companies understood. What I want you folks to understand is that unstable times create opportunities. And it's your opportunity right now to seize it. And last but not least, if you think of nothing else, there's one thing to always remember as you move forward as the tsunami comes forward and you're looking to write your own true survival tsunami story. It's that the best time to wake up befo was before. The best next and last time is right now. Last but not least, I have three books coming out later this year. Community, Leadership, and Justice, all in the 21st century. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Are there someone with questions? Nobody? Don't be shy. I don't bite. I swear. Uh, we have one question. I know you're hungry. I'm hungry too. That's where all the humans are. <laughs> it's not uh, a real question yet, but um, could you repeat one of your last statements about um, how you get... Um, Can you speak up? Yeah. Thank you. How you get uh, or what you get by having a third uh, vision, mission, strategy, and third values? Vision, mission strategy is underlied by shared values all right right leaders have shared mission vision values correct and how uh, what's your approach in uh, getting them through in a time of change well it goes back to the graph that we showed before the cpk graph culture process knowledge so i'll give you an example right one of the biggest problems that companies have is co-founders they don't get along they don't get along after a year or two because they never sat down and started talking about the hard things before they started the company, right? What you have is one co-founder normally who wants to work 24-7 all the time. And usually the other side, you have a co-founder who's a family person or is about to have a family, right? So you have somebody where when you're just working, you're working hard and you're doing the startup thing, right? It's not a big issue because you're both working very hard. But when you get a year or two in, Right? You start to scale the company, you get three employees, five employees, maybe ten. Maybe you're bringing in a little seed money, who knows. Right? What happens is, is you bring in scale, problems that aren't addressed up front are magnified. And the biggest challenge you see is usually one co-founder is a workaholic, and the other co-founder is looking to at least take weekends off, or maybe even just a day. Right? But what happens is, they don't talk about it. So then guess what? Then they become a million dollar company, or a ten million dollar company. And they have twenty employees, right? And then when they do, you start to see that resentment boil up. And the reason why is because the shared mission, vision, and values of the company were never discussed before they started the company in the first place. More questions? Nobody? We have one question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so actually, it's uh, piggybacking off his question, is when you're talking about visions with 
someone you want to do a business with or to do a project with, what kind of questions should be you should the two people or three or however many people ask each other ahead of time? <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, the first thing I always do, to be honest with you, is have them take psychological profiles. Uh, there's two profiles that matter. And everybody always laughs, like her in the back, but it's actually true because, you know, brains are hardwired a certain way. And that's perfectly fine. We can have different brains that are hardwired in different ways, but we have to understand how to communicate and what somebody means when they are communicating. So the first step is there's two tests that you take. One's called the Strength Finder 2.0. One is called the, KB, the Colby A-type test, right, with a K. So that's the first step, right? And that gives you the opportunity to understand the communication, the way in which uh, each person in the relationship communicates, and then it helps you also understand how each co-founder feels value. That's step one. Step two is then you start to map out the goals. One year, three year, five year, 10 year, both personally and professionally, right? The professional goals are normally the easy part to figure out. It's always the personal goals, particularly at the three and five year mark that are where the cracks start to happen, right? And then third is more of a maintenance thing, right? You should always have a, a check-in, whether that's every week, every month, every six months, and have a brutal check-in. You know, Martin Luther King talks about a concept called ruthless love, and that's what transparency and accountability really is at its root, right? If you're going to found a company with somebody, it's a marriage, right? You don't, in, you don't get into a marriage with somebody you don't truly love, right? And when you're in a marriage, right, where you have shared mission, vision, and values, sometimes you have to have ruthless love and you have to tell the hard truth and you have to hold each other accountable right success doesn't come without friction it's true in a marriage it's true in a partnership right a marriage is a partnership and so is co-founding a company we have one question over here okay um, well, what kind of uh, companies have you made or startups or Stuff like oh that. boy, healthcare company, skincare company. I've owned a newspaper group. I built one of the largest event companies for entrepreneurs in the world. Um, I've sat on boards all over the world. I've founded nonprofits, stuff like that. More questions? Uh, when you were explaining about the the three, um, you had three circles: one of culture, sure. process, and knowledge yes that sir. intersect. At the center is the entrepreneur. Yes, sir. Where is the politician? <laughs> the change maker politician. Sure, right. So this is a great question. It's the same formula no matter how you look at it. What what happens is, we don't spend enough time thinking about geography. Right. So let me tell you what I mean. The fact of the matter is, do you, do you know the dissemination of ideas, how the bell curve maps to the dissemination of ideas, right? The super early adopters is the first 3.5% of a bell curve, right? And then there's 12.5% and there's 32.5%, right? And that's when you get into the bell curve. What happens is we don't normally take the time to have strategies towards finding that 3.5% of policymakers who matter to us, right? So if we live here in the Netherlands, we just think here or Amsterdam is the right place to find, you know, a mayor or a senator or a prime minister who cares about what we care, right? In reality, let's say we have a telemedicine company, right? Maybe, t maybe the, the, the mayor that cares is actually in Kigali, Rwanda, or maybe he's in Sao Paulo, Brazil, or maybe he's in Seattle, Washington, or maybe she's in, you know, Kampala, Uganda, or she might be in, heck, I don't know, Kabul, Afghanistan. And so that's the challenge that we have most of the time is that, number one, we don't think about the fact that we're not looking for everybody. We're looking for just one or two folks to get on that bandwagon, right? Number two, we always think that whoever is surrounding us is the right folks. And that's almost never true because the environment dictates where those change makers truly are, right? You might have great entrepreneurs who are change makers here, and you might have great business executives from big multinationals but your government might be in a horrible, horrible spot when it comes to change makers, right? And there's lots of examples of, of that all over at the, the local, state, and federal level all over the world. So that would be actually what, what I would say to you because they're there and when you lead with culture, when you lead with what your vision is and your shared values, as long as you're willing to hop on a plane, you will find them. 
And if you have a particular solution that you know, you're looking to speak to a legislator about, I do a lot of work uh, at the local, state, and the federal level all over the United States. Uh, so if there's something in particular you want to talk about after, I'm happy to do that. Are there more questions? We have enough time, so no one? No? All right, All right humans, thank you very much. Have a good night. Get some food. I'm going to get some food. <laughs>